Hey, hi everyone. Hello everyone. We'll we'll start off with the with the workshop for code review automation, and we'll see what tools we can use and uh, how we can use Deep Source to aut automate code reviews. So, yep, let me share my screen. Yeah. So uh, we'll start with. Uh, so hello and welcome to everyone. So uh, we'll today we today we'll talk about automating code reviews using Deep Source, and. So we'll see what how we can uh, make code review the code review process as efficient as possible, as painless as possible, and so we'll first see what the what the pain points are in code review. The the most important thing is uh, I think we can probably sum it to a single thing. If if we had a, a year to review a pull request, we'll probably do it really well, but we don't. So even if we have 50 lines of code that need to be reviewed, or sometimes you know I, I've been guilty of that, sending pull requests with 3,000 lines of code. So uh, when when you see code uh, lines of code like that, you uh, you end up uh, you sort of uh, just end end up writing you know the code looks good to me. Why why don't you just merge it? So uh, I've been guilty of that too. Of writing LGPM in, in pull requests, large pull requests. So uh, the uh, one thing would be that the reviews should be fast, not so fast, but uh, you know, fast enough, not not uh, to frustrate the actual submitter of the patch. And uh, but the issue with pull requests is that there are certain uh, problems in the code that might be easy to miss, especially in very large pull requests. So uh, then there are certain issues. So maybe uh, you never define a variable, right? But you are using it somewhere. Let's say you never defined x, but you are using x, print x somewhere. And uh, if you are using a compiled language and you use some kind of compilation step before, uh, you know, uh, before uh, submitting the code, then you are probably good to go. But, uh, if you are working on an uh, on an interpreted version, for example, if you are using C Python, you'll probably never encounter that unless it goes into the runtime. So, uh, but uh, humans might probably miss them. But uh, automated tools, because we know that these are the you know, these are the you know, mistakes that programmers might make. So we can almost always automate. We can automate most of this stuff, right? So that the humans can only focus on the logic, what what uh, what the code is supposed to do, and maybe even verify the tests uh, and and how the code is organized and what kind of architecture it follows. Uh, maybe you want it refactored. It is not so easy for uh, uh, it. It's not so easy to automate how uh, that code should be refactored. But uh, the rest of this stuff, some uh, fairly common things, they can be automated. Right. Also, uh, as a company grows, or even if you are not a company and uh, you are uh, developing uh, alone, so you may want to follow what the community wants you to follow, right? So, if you want two spaces, if you want a trailing comma at the end of uh, end of a dictionary or a hash map, uh, so uh, let's say whatever whatever the community tells you to do, so you'll probably do that. And uh, if you are a uh, if you are a team, you'll probably do what everybody else is doing. Because uh, you have you have a set of guidelines, but if those guidelines are not properly enforced, uh, it it seems unlikely that anybody will follow them. Not out of malice, but because they might miss following them. Right? So uh, enforcing them or uh, consistently asking the developers. I remember when I was uh, uh, I, I think it was five years ago when I was doing my internship, and my mentor would ask me to Hey, did you uh, did you run pilot on this? Did you run uh, did you run flake it on this? Because I used to write Python, and uh, that that is actually painful, right? So uh, uh, so uh, we need a way to enforce those coding coding guidelines, the code, the coding standards. Right? So uh, th that brings us to automation. Now the great programmer Seneca uh, said when he was in Rome right? that to err uh, to err uh, is is human, but to persist in error is devilish or di diabolical. So uh, there, there are certain certain uh, 
certain uh, examples of this. The one, for example, one that that I just said, you never define a variable, but you are using it, or maybe you defined a variable, but you forgot to use it somewhere, right? Or maybe you write, you wrote, you added a new function, perhaps, but you never uh, added tests for that function. Now, uh, all the all of the linters are going to tell you that even if you are using a linter. Uh, that that's also a different matter. If you uh, so none of the linters are going to tell you, hey, this this is not covered in test. But uh, uh, but we need a tool that says uh, you know what uh, you you added this code, but this only this particular three lines of code are not covered in tests. And uh, there should be an easy way of telling that as well because uh, it is tedious to look at look at uh, uh, a particular line of code and understand. Un unless you are running it, that it is covered in tests or not. So uh, another issue, like I just said, if you uh, never define a variable but use it, you will uh, inevitably hit it at some point, uh, hit hit a snag in production. You will uh, encounter a runtime error, and uh, and then you will have to I don't know run run a debugger in production. I've done that. So. Uh, uh, you, you could do uh, maybe maybe you'll do that. So. The best way to do uh, the best way to find issues is in a code review, and uh, I think this there's a, there's even a term for that that is called shifting the entire process left. So this is usually used for security, but uh, you know if if you find your errors before it hits production, then it it's actually a win for you. And how do we exactly automate code reviews? Now, mind you, we can't automate all of uh, the entire code review. You know, we can't we can't look for uh, logical errors. We can't look for uh, re refactoring uh, issues. Uh, so there there is a very small subset of what we can automate, but that actually saves at a, saves a lot of time. So static analysis essentially means uh, statically analyzing. So the code is not actually running. You are reading it just like you uh, maybe read read an essay. And then, uh, and then you find out, hey, this this is a mistake. This is a mistake. So that's what a human does, right? They're maybe they are also dry running the program in their mind, but uh, a static analyzer does not even dry run anything. So it, it just uh, uh, reads the code. So the simplest thing could be, let's say, uh, you assign x to x. Let's say uh, in, in a particular line of code, you have written x equal to x. So that is an issue. And that could probably be missed by by a human being, but for uh, in, any uh, any simple uh, pattern matching would tell you that uh, this is an issue. So even that is static analysis, and uh, all the static analyzers that we write at deep source are uh, of course uh, a lot more uh, complex than that. But it, it all boils down to reading the code, performing some uh, certain operations on them, and then trying to uh, and then trying to find issues in the code. And if you think you have never used a static analyzer, uh, you probably have because even if you have used, uh, I think, a Babel JS, or or if you have used any compiled language, all all of those languages, all of those uh, implementations use some kind of static analysis to optimize the code, to minify the code, uglify the code, right? all of that. So now, uh, now what what are the most common tools that that you could probably use to, to find bugs in, in the code. Right? So uh, the, the popular ones, the ones that we used before we built deep source, uh, you know, some some of these. So we use PyLint, we use static check for Go, RuboCoff for Ruby, ESLint for JavaScript. Right. Uh, so these are a lot of. Uh, there are also a lot other other tools that we can't mention in this slide, and uh, and then there are some SaaS, SaaS platforms. Exactly like Deep Source, right? So uh, Deep Source is a SaaS platform. So uh, now, uh, how how do we use those linters? Let's let's say we, we only want to use the linters, the open source linters. How do we use them? So the first thing could be that uh, you could run run in your ID while developing. Let's say uh, uh, let's say you are you are using a, uh, the most popular ID. Let's say VS Code, and then uh, every time you save your file, you uh, you have set it up such that you run ESLint every time you you save your JavaScript file, right? So uh, that in that way you can uh, at least for yourself you can make sure that you are not uh, uh, you are not making the common mistakes. But then uh, 
uh, as a team how do you uh, how do you verify that the other guys are also running it you know uh, again not out of malice but maybe they missed it right maybe something was not working uh, or maybe uh, they found the issues there but they did not have the have the time to uh, have the time to fix them so they just pushed the code so in order to do that you'll probably run eslint on the on the entire code base in in your ci as well uh, let's say uh, what your ci along with your tests you are also running uh, you are also running eslint and then uh, and then what what do you do so in in ci ci uh, you have a lot of logs right uh, uh, they, they look just like server logs and you have to browse through all the logs in order to find what what the issue is and in fact there is a lot of noise when you are using uh, when you are using it in ci because uh, in order to weed out the noise you have to really configure it very well right so uh, anyway so this is how you would use linters and uh, these are the problems that you would face right so you would have a lot of false positives there would be uh, a lot of noise for example uh, do you really want to see if uh, if you are using i don't know double double spaces instead of four spaces are using tabs instead of spaces or would you rather uh, would you rather use some other tool to do that and uh, maybe uh, not not show all those issues in your ci logs so that that involves configuring uh, configuring your uh configuring your linters uh, and and the configurations are actually quite complex in fact uh, in in a lot of uh, in, in a lot of open source repositories we have seen that pe uh, uh, programmers usually only enable one or two uh, rules from those linters so that uh, they they never have to uh, browse through all the logs and uh, uh, you know probably they will they will get away with a lot of bugs but they will be able to fix a few of them Right. so uh, so that also uh, gives you uh, too many issues to fix and uh, because you always know that uh, uh, your standard is uh, converting single quotes to double quotes in languages like javascript or uh, python for example uh, let's say you only use double quotes and you want to convert all single quotes to double quotes so uh, it it uh, frankly gets boring at times uh, so uh, you probably want to automate that as well so uh, what what could be the solutions to that uh, if if you look at any open source code uh, or even your own code base if you use any linters then you will find a lot of ignore directives uh, ignore directives like uh, pylint ignore uh, or eslint ignore i think it is pylint disable eslint ignore or uh, yeah also uh, comments like that is thrown across the code across the code base right or you can uh, configure like like i just said you can configure the uh, the entire uh, uh, linter using a complex configuration format or you can uh, configure the language servers locally because if you want to run it locally i you, you either have to use an uh, a pre configured id or you can or you will have to set up language servers locally right or the fourth option is to just use deep source and we'll probably talk about that but before that uh, what what about large teams so uh, if if you look at it uh, if even large teams or if even if you look at uh, open source repositories that have grown uh, that have a lot of contributors that have a lot of users so what what happens eventually uh, so you start uh, you start accumulating a, lo a lot of technical debt uh, in the beginning maybe because of the pace that you were going at you did not have time to fix all of these issues and then throughout the code you find issues like uh, i don't know uh, something like uh, undefined variables and uh, maybe uh, uh, or maybe uh, you define variables but never use them or uh, maybe certain performance issues in the code that that you never saw but uh, but uh, these are some of the issues that uh, a static analyzer detected can detect for you and then uh, as as you also keep writing code throughout all these years you also collect a set of rules so uh, let's say you always want to run uh, black or uh, black or go from on your code uh, before before pushing it so that is one kind of rule or uh, let's say you always want to uh, uh, you always want to use single quotes instead of double quotes so uh, these are some of the guidelines and uh, let's say you uh, you probably don't care about security issues in your uh, application because it is a cli 
and uh, your CLI, you know, it it never accesses network. It uh, it never really uh, is used by another user. So you probably can go, uh, get away with security issues that are raised by uh, a lot of linters. But you can, uh, but you can never uh, get away with performance issues. You you take performance issues very seriously. So these are the set of coding guidelines that you eventually formulate, and most of these are very informal. You you never really write it down. You, uh, you just pass on from generation to generation, uh, practically. Uh, yeah, uh, and then. Uh, because of uh, a huge user base as well. So in, in especially in large things. Uh, so because they have a large user base, uh, probably. Uh, so security practices also uh, are, are very important, right? So uh, security practices may include, uh, may include, may include practices like uh, never using outdated dependencies or uh, dependencies that you are sure that uh, that they have some kind of uh, vulnerabilities, or maybe uh, uh, nev uh, never using HTTP or HTTPS, uh, or, you know, T uh, TLS. So uh, stuff like that. So you you probably have to check for all of that. And again, checking for all of them manually might uh, things might get missed. Right? So uh, why why not automate all of them? So. Uh, so we'll now talk about uh, deep source. Right? Remember when I said that uh, in order to configure uh, an existing linter to show only the issues that are important to you, you need to configure a lot. Well, uh, this is all the configuration that you need to uh, get started with Python analyzer in deep source. Right? So just just four four lines of code and five lines if you include the new line, we'll include that for readability. Right? And uh, and then, uh, of course, you start wherever you can. So that, uh, of course, your, your code, if you can see here, your code has 115 issues. But there are only 37 recommended issues. Right. So uh, instead of getting overwhelmed by all those 115 issues, and if you are just getting started with static analysis, you'll probably have upwards of 1,000 issues in your code. And I'm being very uh, conservative with the number. It might be much larger. But uh, for, for this repository, let's say you have 37 issues. So you can just get started with the recommended issues. You can start fixing them one by one. And then when, once you are done with the recommended issues, then you can go ahead with fixing all the other, other kind of issues. Right? So uh, uh, yeah, so, so deep source understands what, that uh, you don't have time to fix your technical debt all at once. So probably go get started slowly and then uh, only fix what you can. So if, if we showed you all the issues, all thousand issues on, on your face at the same time, you'd probably ne uh, not fix even one of them. Right? Because if every issue is important, then no issue is important. So uh, now now coming, coming to security. So uh, like we said, uh, a, a repository with a large user base uh, uh, so might need to enforce a lot of security guidelines. And this, most of the security uh, practices, most of the security operations that happen usually happen uh, much later in the development process, perhaps right before deployment, perhaps right before, uh, uh, you know, in, in the staging phases and stuff. But even in security, of course, we can't, uh, we can't really automate all of the security uh, issues, right? We, we can't really find all of the security issues in the code. But uh, statically uh, analyzing your code, uh, we can uh, look for a lot of issues in, in your code that might probably uh, end, end up in, in some kind of vulnerability in your code. Right? So some of the most common ones, let's say uh, you commit your code and then you, uh, by mistake, you have checked in your, uh, your key. Let's say, so uh, you see this regex, this is for the uh, AWS, uh, AWS access key. Right, so if you check in by mistake, maybe you'll uh, uh, you'll never know that. And even if somebody gets access ever to a repository, remember Murphy's law: if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So if somebody ever gets access to your code, they'll probably get access to this access key. And uh, who knows? Maybe you have you have even committed your secret key, and they will get access to your uh, uh, maybe your AWS bucket or whatever this uh, this secret key is for. So th this is a very important thing to check for. 
and another thing is uh, OWASP top 10 rules. So OWASP is a uh, OWASP top 10 rules are a list of rules that uh, that can be statically analyzed, and they should be statically analyzed uh, and and checked for. So rules may include things like uh, broken authentication, maybe uh, the uh, uh, you know, so uh, passing the credentials correctly or not reading the credentials correctly or uh, or stuff like uh, uh, in insecure connections you are you are making insecure connections so th those are the things that that factor in as part of OWASP top 10 rules and similarly there are a lot of rules that can be covered uh, that can be checked for uh, by static analysis so uh, it, it is always recommended to shift uh, to uh, make these security checks as early as possible you know probably right after commit right after uh, writing your code or committing your code and uh, if you look at deep source we, we uh, at deep source we support all the OWASP top 10 issues and and uh, some more so we we even have a, uh, a secret detection uh, engine so we detect all the secrets if you have ever even by mistake checked in or even if you have commented out a secret and checked in will will tell you that uh, so this uh, will will tell you that uh, this this is a mistake you should not have checked this in and uh, th so these are the kind of uh, security issues that we raise. This is specifically for Python. And in fact, some of these can even be auto fixed. And we'll see what auto fix are, what auto fixes are. So uh, if you look at it, you can, uh, because most of these issues are raised automatically, uh, it, it uh, begs the question what if some of those could, could be fixed automatically, right? And we just saw a workshop on auto fixes and transformers. And uh, you see all these buttons here, uh, auto fix, auto fix. So you can uh, you can just click on in any of these and uh, run auto fix on them. And 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 we get we get the auto fixes for that. In fact, we can even create pull requests from right here and. Uh, and this this will create a pull request on whatever VCS provider you're using, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, right? So this this is what it is, and and uh, because uh, because Deep Source works uh, on because Deep Source uh, integrates tightly with all these VCS providers, so this is a, an example a snapshot of the GitHub check. So uh, you should check things just as often as you run your tests, right? So, uh, because even if you change anything in your code and uh, something might break, so you run tests all the time. In, in a similar way, you should uh, you should check for uh, code quality as often, as often as possible. Right? So in this check, if you see deep source uh, Python, Python uh, check passes, in, which means there were no issues in Python code, but the test coverage uh, check fails because some of the lines that were changed changed in this PR, they were not really covered in tests, so that that fails. So, uh, so checking uh, as as early as possible and as often as possible gives uh, really gives us uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time to uh, a, a lot of leeway to uh, not not make mistakes. Right? And the the other thing is transformers. So, how do you make your code look better? So, uh, I am also guilty of this, but I, I used to write code back then before I started writing Python, uh, where I, I would not format the code properly. And uh, it, it really made uh, reading code uh, painful. Right? So, uh, and I, I was not even aware of that there were formatters to do that. So, uh, so what, what would be the ways to make your code look better? Uh, so there, there are a lot of a lot of formatters, sort of formatters uh, out there. A lot of open source ones. So if you look at Python, you have Black. If you look at Go, you have the built-in Go font, right? Uh, so what what could you do? Maybe right before committing, you, you could probably set up a pre-commit hook, right? And uh, af uh, after committing, maybe uh, in in the PR again because you are not sure if the pre-commit hook ran or not. You are, you are going to ask the developer, hey, did you run the formatters? Did you run Go font on this on this code? Or you could just use deep source, right? And the configuration is as simple as it was for uh, for uh, analysis. So you all all you do is add three lines: transformers, name equal to black, and equal to equal to true, done, right? And then 
uh, and the workflow is as simple. Uh, so all that you need to do is add these three lines and Every time you check in your code, there will be this. Uh, if if there are if there is code that does not conform to your black standards, it will uh, Deep Source will create a new pull request with all these changes, and it will uh, and it will tell you that uh, hey, uh, we have transformed it now. The checks pass now. now your uh, transforms uh, are, are all right. Now your code looks pretty, and you can just go ahead with this. And this is the beautiful code that we are talking about. So. Uh, this is a convention that many people have sing converting single quotes to double quotes in Python and uh, having two two spaces between uh, between two I, I think this is yeah uh, be between a, a class and and the main thing right so so this this is something that uh, that that a lot of uh, lot of teams follow the convention of so you can always uh, fall back to this and make sure that uh, your code never ever uh, fails to conform to any standards ever again. Now, uh, as we talked about, so as, as a team starts growing, they they start building their own style guide. They start, uh, uh, you know, so uh, and the style guide is mostly informal, right? So, uh, what what do you do now? So, how how do you uh, formalize that? So, uh, deep source. So, uh, we have a component at deep source that actually learns from what actions you take on your issues and uh, whether you uh, actually uh, want to fix an issue or whether you whether you have fixed an issue in the past or whether you almost always ignore that issue all, and all, all these things right so uh, deep source learns from your actions and the more you use deep source the the better it understands which issues you would like to see first and which issues you would like to see uh, later on probably so you remember the recommendations tab that I showed in the beginning. So you start wherever you can. Well, that tab is dynamic, and it changes according to what according to what you uh, what how you prefer to use static analysis. So in the end, you you end up with you end up with some kind of uh, you know you you end up with some kind of style guide for yourself uh, that is a little more formal than the informal style guide that you had. And another thing for large teams, uh, large teams are usually concerned about uh, that that their code should not leave their uh, their infrastructure because they have certain compliances to follow. So deep source works on your infrastructure. Uh, there is a deep source enterprise plan that always uh, that that you can install on your cloud, and your code will never leave your 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 infrastructure ever again. So uh, to, to summarize all of this, start wherever you can. Start uh, as uh, you know, uh, start uh, with the easiest things that you can do. So the the recommendations, you know, the things that you should fix first. That that those would be the best things to do, and then enforce these processes. Check as check early, check often, and then build build up slowly. So. Uh, uh, as as you uh, slowly start fixing all those issues, your technical debt slowly starts going down. So, uh, uh, and then you you of course never have to uh, ask your ask your PR submitters. Hey, did you write tests for these changes? Hey, did you run black on this? Did you run any auto formatters on this? So you'll never have to do any of that. Right? Uh, did you even run pilot for this? Not even that. Right. So and, and the bonus of course is that you can run deep source on your cloud. So. That that is it. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. I think we have a few more uh, really exciting announcements that are coming up following this. We uh, there are a few major uh, uh, releases that are happening. So uh, stay tuned, and you'll you'll, uh, you'll uh, hear from some kids. Uh, bye bye.